There's a reason for why we do things the way we do them today, and almost most of the time we can find these reasons in history. History has shaped our lives the way we're shaping future lives. And so if you're into bike fitting or cycling biomechanics, you may find it interesting to know where some of today's concepts and philosophies came from. As such, this video is for you. So yeah, when did all this business about cycling biomechanics start? What was the current practice 20, 30 years ago? In this video, I answered these questions and I identified the three most important milestones in cycling history that shape what we do in bike fitting assessments today. Okay, this will be perhaps the most unfounded and controversial statement I'll ever do, but forget about the radio, uh, TV, internet, computer, microchips, uh, airplanes. The bicycle is the biggest invention in the history of mankind. Well, actually, the guitar. That's a really close second though. All right, it's a tie between the guitar and the bicycle, but in transportation, the bicycle is the biggest invention in the history of mankind, period. Going back in time, saddle height is perhaps the most studied aspect in cycling. But a quick PubMed search reveals how young the field of cycling science really is. The first proper study on saddle height was conducted in 1939, but studies into cycling were few and sparse until the late 90s. I mean, we're talking about two or three studies per decade. It wasn't until 2005 that we saw a real boom in cycling research. And by real boom, I mean a whopping eight papers in that year in the entire world. From 2010, the term cycling biomechanics started to be used more regularly and research into saddle height was now integrated in this larger uh, field of research. Now to illustrate how this is still not a lot of research, you can look at this graphic which compares the number of studies on cycling biomechanics to the number of studies that contains the keywords knee pain. And just for funsies, let's compare knee pain to something like, oh, I don't know, cancer research, just to get a different perspective. So you see, we're quite a young field, and that, to me, is very exciting, because it means there is so much yet to learn and discover. As far as I could find out, the term bike fitting appears for the first time in the scientific literature in 1998. Before then, bike fitting wasn't necessarily bike fitting, it was more uh, bike sizing. And bike builders would use static measurements in order to build different frame geometries for different riders. In the decade between 1970 and 1980, bike builders were using the cycling manual or the Kony method to guide them in the frame building process. This manual is now a collector's item, you can pay up to 200, 300 pounds for it. But if you're interested, there's a really nice uh, book review by Park Tool, and I'll put a link down below. This was considered the cycling bible at the time, and if you're one of the lucky few to hold a copy of this book, in part three, you can find a whole chapter with guidelines for position on the bike. This was arguably the first attempt at a scientific approach to place someone on a bicycle as this book would encourage the reader to take static measurements from the rider and compare them to normative data acquired by the Italian Federation of Sports. You can see how this can go wrong, because most of us, common mortals, are not professional cyclists outputting uh, 350 plus watts of FTP. So along came someone called Ben Sarota, who was a bike builder in the 70s, who identified some of the weaknesses of this manual and move towards a more individual approach to bike sizing away from the general normative guidelines. Ben and his team built what can be considered the first ever bike fitting jig or bike sizing jig, kind of like that one that you see behind me. And they use this manually adjustable jig to size bikes. By the way, you can find all this information in Ben Sarota uh, Institute's page and there's a link down below for that as well. However, we're still very much in the realm of bike sizing. That was until William Farrell from the New England Cycling Academy developed the first widely available fit system in the world, the Fit Kit. The Fit Kit consisted of instruments to take static measurements, a software to record the data, and normative tables which would provide a loose estimate of bike size. But William Farrell was also responsible for the first ever purposely built bike fitting tool in 1991, the RAD or Rotational Adjustment Device. 
The rod was used for cleat alignment, very much in the same fundamental way that uh, modern cleat alignment tools work. And for the first time, we were able to medially or laterally rotate the shoe and actually quantify that rotation. So this meant we were now able to collect hundreds of data points from cyclists who were complaining with knee pain and compare that to those cyclists who were asymptomatic. At about the same time the fit kit became available in the 80s, this little book came out. And if you look carefully, in this book there's a whole chapter dedicated to how to fit your bicycle. Mm -hmm. I think most people will agree that the turnaround point for bike fitting to be established as an industry was in 1984 when Look successfully launched the PP65s and the Delta cleats. The clipless pedals were born. Interesting fact, the clipless pedals, even though you do clip on to the pedal, are named that way because of the predecessor system which used straps and a toe clip um, to hold the shoe in place. The same toe clip system that was popularized by Jason Statham in the first movie of the Transporter Trilogy in the oil fight scene. No, it wasn't. So why was this a turnaround point, you might ask? Well, um, now the foot was fixed to the pedal, no float which made the rest of the kinetic chain more prone to ascending momentum and torque forces. And what was the first relay station for these forces? Yep, the knee, of course, which meant knee pain and knee injury as a result of these inverse um, kinetic dynamics. From here, pedals evolved to include a float, which would give the leg more degrees of movement. In the early 90s, these were the common practices to fit athletes into bikes. To determine the frame size, the cyclist would straddle the bike and lift the entire frame until it pressed against the crotch, and the distance between the wheels and the floor would have to be between 7 and 15 centimeters. For saddle height, you'd use a goniometer to have the knee between 25 and 30 degrees of extension at the bottom dead center of the crank. For saddle fore aft, you'd either use the plumb line method to align the knee with the tip of your shoe, or you'd use the elbow and fist method. For saddle tilt, it was anyone's guess, but with men advised to have the saddle tilted upwards a little bit in this paper, and women downwards. And that was it, that was the standard practice in the, in the early 90s. But there were other philosophies across the years, and uh, as technology evolved, so did our understanding of some of these fit variables. And as a result, this field of science was starting to come alive with a constant flow of ideas and studies. During the 90s, there was only one uh, centre in the world that had both the technology and the expertise to uh, conduct bike fits as we know them today. This was the Boulder Center for Sports Medicine, uh, established and led by Andy Pruitt, who had at the time one of the most advanced 3D motion capture systems available for uh, elite athletes at first, but then uh, in 1998 opened the doors to the general public. However, it was not until 2007 that we saw the launch of arguably the most successful uh, tool in bike fitting history. And this was only 12 years ago. This tool is called Retool. It's a portable motion capture system. Being a triathlete myself, the way I heard about Retool was because of Craig Crowey Alexander, who uh, placed second in Kona in 2007, and then went on to win twice in a row in 2008 and 2009, and then, and then again in 2011. Craig raced for the first time in full Ironman distance in 2007. Crowey was coming from an um, Olympic distance background, but he'd also done some uh, half Ironman distances, and so using the retool system to get Crowey's position uh, ready for the full Ironman distance was crucial. Crowey was the first athlete Retool ever sponsored and from there on things just took off for Retool. I think we can say that triathlon uh, is intimately connected to bike fitting and it is because of triathlon and Retool that all of us age groupers and commuters and cycling aficionados can enjoy the benefits of a bike fit.
I just have to make a quick, quick stop here to let you know about this fascinating podcast by Hugo Mendes with Franco Vaterot, who, for those who don't know, is one of the co-founders of Retool. In the late 90s and early 2000s, Franco was involved in developing hyperbaric tents as a way to simulate hypoxia as a means of altitude training. And this was very new in 2001, for instance. At the same time, I was studying these same techniques as an undergrad in sports science. And so this incredible podcast by Hugo Mendes is a real gem that delves into the history of modern Ironman. And I strongly encourage you to watch it. Moving forward in time, we started seeing a shift from bike sizing to actually modifying and adapting the bikes to the individual needs of each athlete. This is at the core of bike fitting where you try to change and adapt a bicycle to fit within what the individual needs. Which brings us more or less to today. Retool still exists today and it's a very popular system, although it is starting to, to show its age and there are arguably more advanced 3D mocap tools out there today. To conclude, I know that there are some people out there that uh, think that the term bike fitting is outdated and for a moment there I shared the same opinion but I've since realized that instead the current bike fitting practice is split into two branches. If you want to find out more about this, uh, I have created a video about the modern bike fit. That's it for this video. Don't forget to subscribe. This channel is all about science and making knowledge accessible. Ta-ra!